uh, chapter 5, The Storm and What Came of It. It was nearly three weeks after their landing that uh, 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 the Dawn Treader was towed out of Narrow Haven Harbor. Very solemn farewells had been spoken, and a great crowd had assembled to see her departure. There had been cheers and tears, too, when Caspian made his last speech to the Lone Islanders and parted from, from the Duke and his family. But as the ship, her purple sail still flapping idly, drew further from the shore, and the sound of Caspian's trumpet from the poop came fainter across the water, everyone became silent. Then she came into the wind. <sighs> the sail swelled out. The tug cast off and began rowing back. The first real wave ran up under the Dawn Treader's prow, and, and she was a live ship, ship again. The men off duty went below. Drinian took the first walk, watch of the poop, uh, and she turned her head eastward round the south of Avra. The next few days were delightful. Lucy thought she was the most fortunate girl in the world as she woke each morning to see the reflections of the sunlit water dancing on the ceiling of her cabin and looked round on all the nice new things she had got in the Lone Islands. Sea boots and buskins and cloaks and jerkins and scarves. And then she would go on deck and take a look from the forecastle at a, at a sea which was a brighter blue each morning. Uh, and drink it in air that was a little warmer day by day. After that came breakfast and such an appetite as one only has at sea. She spent a good deal of time sitting on the little bench in the stern playing chess with Ribuchi. It was amusing to see him lifting the pieces, which were far too big for him, with both paws and standing on tiptoes if he made a move near the center of the board. He was a good player, and when he remembered what he was doing, he, he usually won. But every now and then, Lucy won because the mouse did something quite ridiculous, like setting a knight into... Uh, <laughs> the danger of a queen and castle combined. This happened because he had momentarily forgotten it was a game of chess and was thinking of a real battle and making the knight do what he would certainly have done in its place. For his mind was full of forlorn hopes, death or glory charges, and last stands. But this pleasant time did not last. There came an evening when Lucy, gazing idly astern at the long furrow or wake they were leaving behind them, saw a great rack of clouds building itself up in the west with amazing speed. Then a gap was torn in it, and a yellow sunset poured through the gap. All the waves behind them seemed to take on unusual shapes, and the sea was a drab or yellowish color like dirty canvas. The air grew cold. The ships seemed to move on. Uneasily, as if she felt danger behind her. The sail would be flat and limp in one minute and widely full the next. While she was nothing, <laughs> while she was noting these things and wondering at, at a sinister change which had come over the very noise of the wind, Drinian cried, All hands on deck! In a moment, everyone became frantically busy. The hatches were battened down. The galley fire was put out. Men went aloft to reef the sail. Before they had finished the storm, the storm struck them. It seemed to Lucy that a great valley in the sea opened just before their bows, and they rushed down into it. <sighs> Deeper down than she would have believed possible. A great gray hill of water, far higher than the mast, rushed to meet them. It looked certain deaf, but they were tossed to the top of it. Then the ship seemed to spin round. <laughs> a cataract of water poured over the deck. The poop and forecastle were like two islands with a fierce sea between them. Up aloft, the sailors were lying out along the yard desperately trying to get control of the sail. A broken rope stood out sideways in the wind as straight and, and stiff as if, was a, as if it was a poker. Get below, ma'am. Baldrinian and Lucy, knowing that landsmen and landswomen are a nuisance to, to the crew, began to obey. It was not easy. The Dawn Treader was listing terribly to starboard, and the deck sloped, sloped uh, like the roof of a house. She had to clamber round to the top of the ladder, holding onto the rail, and then stand by while two men climbed up it, and then get down it as best she could. It was well... She was already holding on tight 
For at the foot of the ladder, another wave roared across the deck onto her shoulders. She was already almost wet through, the, through with spray and rain, but this was colder. Then she made a dash for the cabin door and got in and shut out for a moment the appalling sight of the speed with which they were rushing into the dark, but not, of course, the horrible confusion of creakings, groanings, snappings, clatterings, roarings, and, uh, and boomings, which only sounded more alarming below than they had done in the poop. <sighs> and all the next day, and all the next... It went on. It went on till one could hardly even remember a time before it had become, begun. And there always had to be three men at the tiller, and it was as much as three could do to keep any kind of a course. And there always had to be men at the pump, and there was hardly any rest for anyone, and nothing could be cooked, and nothing could be dried, and one man was lost overboard, and they never saw the sun. When it was over, Eustace made the following entry in his diary... September 3rd, the first day for ages when I, when I had been able to write. We had been driven before a hurricane for 13 days and nights. I know that because I kept a careful count, though the others all say it was only 12. Pleasant to be embarked on a dangerous voyage with people who can't even count right. I have had a ghastly time, up and down, enormous waves, hour after hour, usually wet to the skin, and not even an attempt at giving us proper meals. Needless to say, there's no wireless or even a rocket, so no chance of signaling anyone for help. It all proves what I keep on telling them, the madness of setting out in a rotten little tub like this. It would be bad enough even if one was with de decent people instead of fiends in human form. Caspian and Edmund are simply brutal to me. The night we lost our masks, there's only a stump left now, though I was not at all well. They forced me to come on deck and work like a slave. Lucy showed her oar, shoved her oar in by saying that Ribichi was lying to go, only he was too small. I wonder she doesn't see that everything that little beast does is all for the sake of showing off. Even at her age, she ought to have the amount of sense. Today, the beastly boat is level at last, and the sun's out, and we have all been drawing about what to do. We have food enough. Pretty beastly stuff, most of it, to last for 16 days. The poultry were all washed overboard. Even if they hadn't been, the storm would have stopped them laying. The real trouble is water. Two casks seem to have got a leak, knocked in them, and are empty. Naughty and efficiency again. On short rations, half a pint a day each, we've got enough for 12 days. There's still lots of rum and wine, but, but even they realize that would only make them thirstier. If we could, of course, the sensible thing would be to turn west at once and make for the Lone Islands. But it took us 18 days to get where we are, running like mad with the gale behind us. Even if we got an east wind, it might take us far longer to get back. And at present, there's no sign of an east wind. In fact, there's no wind at all. As for rowing back, it would take far too long, and Caspian says the men couldn't row one half a pint of water a day. I'm pretty sure this is wrong. I tried to explain that perspiration really cools people down, so the men would need less water if, if, if they were working. He didn't take any notice of this, which is always his way when he can't think of an answer. The others all voted for going on in the hopes of finding land. I felt it my duty to point out that we didn't know there was any land ahead and try to get them to see the dangers of wishful thinking. <sighs> Instead of producing a better plan, they had the cheek to ask me what I proposed. So I just explained coolly and quietly that I, that I had been kidnapped and brought away on this idiotic voyage without my consent, and it was hardly my business to get them out of their scrape. September 4th. Still becalms. Very short rations for dinner and I got less than anyone. Caspian is very clever at helping and thinks I don't see. Lucy, for some reason, tried to make up to me by offering me some of hers, but that uh, uh, interfering prig Edmund wouldn't let her. Pretty hot sun. Terribly thirsty all evening. 
September 5th. Still becomes it very hot. Feeling rotten all day, and I'm sure I've got a temperature. Of course, they haven't the sense to keep a thermometer on board. September 6th, a horrible day. Woke up in the night knowing I was feverish and must have a drink of water. Any doctor would have said so. Heaven knows I'm the last person to try to get any unfair advantage, but I never dreamed that this water rationing would be meant to apply to a sick man. In fact, I would have woken the others up and asked for some, only I thought it would be selfish to wake them. So I just got up and took my cup and tiptoed out of the black hole we slept in, taking great care not to disturb Caspian and Edmund, for they had been sleeping badly since the heat and the short water began. I always try to consider others whether they are nice to me or not. I got on all... I got out all right into the big room, if you can call it a room, where the row, rowing benches and the luggage are. The thing of water is at this end. All was going beautifully, but before I drawn a couple who should catch me, but that little spy rape. I tried to explain that I was going on deck for a brother there. The, the business about the water had nothing to do with him, and he asked me why I had a cup. He made such a noise that the whole ship was roused. They treated me scandalously. I asked, as I think anyone would have, why Ribichi was sneaking about the water cask in the middle of the night. He said... He said that as he was too small to be any use on deck, he, he did sentry over the water every night so that one more man could go to sleep. Now come the rotten unfairness. They all believed him. Can you beat it? I had to apologize or the dangerous little brute would, would have been at me with his sword. And then Caspian showed up in his true colors as a brutal tyrant and said out loud for everyone to hear that anyone found stealing water in future would get two dozen. I didn't know what this meant till Edmund explained to me. It comes to the sort of books these, those Pevensey kids read. After this Carly threat, Cas Caspian changed his tune and started being patronizing. Said he was sorry for me and that everyone felt just as feverish as I did and we must all make the best of it, etc., etc. Odious stuck up prig, stayed in bed all day today. September 7th. A little wind today, but still from the west. Made a few miles eastward with part of the sail set on what, what Drinian calls the jury mast. That means the, the, bo the bowsprit set upright and tied, they call it lashed, to the stump of the real mast. Still terribly thirsty. September 8th. Still sailing east. I stay in my bunk all day now and see no one except Lucy till the two fiends come to bed. Lucy gives me a little of her water ration. She says girls don't get as thirsty as boys. I had often thought this, but it ought to be more generally known at sea. September 9th. Land in sight, a very high mountain a long way off to the southeast. September 10th. The mountain is bigger and clearer, but still a long way off. Goes again today for the first time since I don't know how long. September 11th. Caught some fish and had them for dinner. Dropped anchor at about 7 p.m. in three fathoms of water in a bay of this mountainous island. Bet it and Caspian wouldn't let us go ashore because it was getting dark and he was afraid of savages and wild beasts. Extra, extra water ration tonight. <sighs> what awaited them on this island was going to concern Eustace more than anyone else. But it cannot be told in his words because after September 11th, he forgot about keeping his diary for a long time. When morning came, with a low gray sky but very hot, the adventurers found they were in a bay encircled by such cliffs and crags that it was like a Norwegian fjord. In front of them, at the head of the bay, there was some level land heavily overgrown with trees that appeared to be cedars, through which a rapid stream came out. Beyond that was a steep ascent. <laughs> A sense ending in in uh, in a jagged ridge, and behind that, a vague darkness of mountains which ran into dull-colored clouds, so that you could not see their tops. The nearer cliffs at each side of the bay were streaked here and there with lines of white, which everyone knew to be waterfalls, though at at that distance they did not show any movement or or make any noise. Indeed, the whole place was very silent, and the water of the bay as smooth as glass. 
It reflected every detail of the cliffs. The scene would have been pretty in a picture, but was rather oppressive in real life. It was not a country that welcomed visitors. The whole ship's company went ashore in two boatloads, and everyone drank and washed. Deliciously in the river and had a meal and, and a rest before Caspian sent four men back to keep a ship and the day's work began. There was everything to be done. The casks must be brought ashore and the faulty ones mended if possible <laughs> and all refilled. A tree, a pine if they could get it, must be felled and made into a new mast. Sails must be repaired. A hunting party organized to shoot any game the land might yield. Clothes to be washed and mended. And countless small breakages on board to be set right. For the Dawn Treader herself, and this was more obvious now uh, that they saw her at a distance, could hardly be recognized as, as the same gallant ship which had left Narrow Haven. She looked a crippled, discolored hulk, which... Anyone might have taken for a wreck, and her officers and crew were no better, lean, pale, red-eyed from lack of sleep, and dressed in rags. As Eustace lay under a tree and heard all these plans being discussed, his heart sank. Was there going to be no rest? It looked as if their first day on the long foreland was going to be quite as hard work as a day at sea. Then a delightful idea occurred to him. Nobody was looking... Nobody was looking. They were all chattering about their ship as, as if they actually liked the beastly thing. Why shouldn't he simply slip away? He would take a stroll inland, find a cool, airy place up, up in the mountains, have a good long sleep, and not rejoin the others till the day's work was over. He felt it would do him good, but he would take great care to keep the bay and the ship in sight so as to be sure of his way back. He wouldn't like... To be left behind in this country. He at once put his plan into action. He rose quietly from his place and walked away among the trees, taking care to go slowly and in an aimless manner so that anyone who saw him would think he was merely stretching his legs. He was surprised to find how quickly the noise of conversation died away behind him and how very silent and warm and dark green the wood became. Soon he felt he could venture on a quicker and more determined stride. This soon brought him out of the wood. The ground began sloping steeply up in front of him. The grass was dry and slippery, but manageable if he used his hands as well as his feet, and though he panted and mopped his forehead a good deal, he plucked away steadily. This showed, by the way, that his new life, little as he suspected it, had already done him so good, the old Eustace, Harold and Albertus Eustace, would have given up the climb after about ten minutes. Slowly and with several rests, he reached the ridge. Here he had expected to have a view into the heart of the island, but the clouds had now come lower and nearer and a sea of fog was rolling to meet him. He sat down and looked back. He was now so high that, that the bay looked small beneath him and miles of sea were visible. <sighs> the... Then the fog from the mountains closed in all round him, thick but not cold, and he laid down and turned this way and that to find the most comfortable position to enjoy himself. But he didn't enjoy himself, or not for very long. He began, almost for the first time in his life, to feel lonely. At first, this feeling grew very gradually, and then he began to worry about the time. There was not the slightest sound. Suddenly, uh, it occurred to him that he might have uh, been lying there for hours. Perhaps the others had gone. Perhaps they had let, let him wander away on purpose simply in order to leave him behind. He leaped up in a panic and began the descent. At first, he tried to do it too quickly, slipped on the steep grass, and slid for several feet. Then he thought this had carried him too far to the left, and as he came up, he had seen precipices on that side. So he clambered up again, as near as he could get to the place he had started from, and began the dis dis descent afresh, bearing to his right. After that, things seemed to be going better. He, he went very cautiously, for he could not see more than a yard ahead, uh, and there was still perfect silence all around him. It is very un unpleasant to, have, to go cautiously when there was a voice inside you saying all the time, Hurry, hurry, hurry! 
For every moment, uh, the terrible idea of being left behind grew stronger. If he had understood Caspian and the Pevensies at all, he would have known, of course, that there was not the least chance of, of their doing any such thing, but he had persuaded himself that they were all fiends in human form. At last, said Eustace, as he came slithering down a slide of loose stones, scree they call it, and found himself on the level. And now, where are those where are those trees? There is there is something dark ahead. Why, I do believe the fog is clearing. It was. The light increased every moment and made him blink. The fog lifted. He was in an utterly unknown valley, and the sea was nowhere in sight. 